the Financial Survival Network, helping you survive and thrive in the new economy. Go to carrylutz.com and sign up for 30 free micro-trainings on financial survival. 1490 WGCH, this is Carrie Lutz, and you're listening to the Financial Survival Network, which is brought to you by Miles Franklin. They've been in business selling gold and silver for over 20 years, and I'm a customer because when you buy, they ship. For more information, find them on the web at milesfranklin.com or give them a call at 800-822-8080 and get a free quote. Danielle Park of JugglingDynamite.com is back again, and she believes that Spanish debt is too big to bail. Hey, Danielle, welcome back to the Financial Survival Network. Thank you, Jerry. It's great to have you back after we met in New York. Yeah, fun. Yeah, you have fun there? I did. Love, always love New York, you know? Yeah, and you you had your son with you, totally Mm -hmm. cute kid. And (laughs) did he have as much fun as you did? Oh, absolutely. He's a big fan. He says he wants to go back for sure. Hey, well, you never know. He might go to school here or something. Who yeah. knows? <laughs> so, so your commentary today, uh, that they can't bail out Spain, which means if they can't bail out Spain, they can't bail out Italy, and they're going to fall like a row of uh, dominoes, right? I mean, is there any other way for this to work out? Well, they could try and keep the bondholders steady a little while longer. They could try and inject more funds. But at the end of the day, it's what we've discussed many times. The the debt levels are so high, you know, so what happens is they're going to try and take them on to the uh, the sovereign balance sheets. And you had the prime minister of Spain saying that that absolutely, you know, there's no chance they're going to bail out the banks. But the reality is in the present paradigm, in the present thinking, they uh, cannot envision, they're terrified of the idea of the banks having to write down asset values. Uh, they're terrified of the ramifications of that means. And so they keep trying to infuse the uh, the capital needed to sustain an unsustainable. So, you know, the thing about it is that the size of the Spanish economy is just so large that there's really no even pretense that you can sort of bail that out. You know, certainly not from the present f- monetary facilities that are available. There's just not enough capital there. And, you know, an interesting thing occurred to me um, uh, if you notice, Carrie, the, yesterday there was a story about China uh, and the idea that they were going to come up with another $3 billion stimulus. Did you catch that? Uh, missed it, no. Bill- okay, billion well, or trillion? Uh, billion. billion. Uh, uh, sorry, wait a second. Trillion, I suppose. Yeah, billion is like an irrelevant word now. It used to be yeah. a billion was a lot of money, even to a government. And now yeah. billion is like a change that falls on the sidewalk. We're into the trillions, and who knows where we go from there. Exactly. So, um, the, but the the idea was that the Chinese would come out with another round of stimulus. It would be about half the size of what they did in 2009. Um, and the, you know, some took that as a very bullish uh, concept with respect to the risk trade, you know, that we're going to see more liquidity in there. You're going to have a lot more gains to the upside in some of these assets. But it was occurring to me that there's something fundamentally different about the Chinese economy and the, and the way that their public funds are um, uh, available versus places like the United States and, Euro- and Europe. Because what happens when they bail out banks in um, the Western world, like ours and Europe, is they then download that obligation or that indebtedness onto the working people, right? They say, don't worry, the taxpayers will, ca- will foot the bill. That's a different scenario than when you look at China, where they've, you know, a certain sect of the government has got the bulk of the wealth. A few people have wealth, but most people don't, right? Mm -hmm. Most people don't contribute much in terms of taxation to the revenue of the government. They get that all from their exports primarily, right? So it's quite a different thing for a government, I think, when it's a, a communist party who is actually controlling the bulk of the nation's wealth to say that they're now going to take money out of their pile 
and give it to an unsustainable system, you know, than saying to the banks in, in the other parts of the world, well, don't worry, we'll bail you out, which doesn't mean that governments are actually giving up the money per se. It means that the working people are going to have to have IOUs and just work that off over time. So I would be much more skeptical of the idea that China will continue to bring endless amounts of stimulus just because of that very dynamic. Yeah. And, you know, it's such a good point because when the governments do bail out these banks, it really builds this resentment because the little guy, you working people out there don't get anything and get no benefit from this. And this fuels this resentment and occupying Wall Street, and the communist uh, system, you know, of of this command and control, which we're guilty of in the West as well, and that's part of the problem, you know, is just going to break apart. It just doesn't look like it can go on much longer because the numbers are too big. Yeah, well, and, and again, my point continues to be that it already broke apart. It already, you know, blew. And now we're just trying to deal with that reality. So I'm actually, you know, again, I go back to longer term, I'm fairly optimistic that we're heading in a better direction today than we have been for many years now. And there's, you know, I go back to things like the uh, U.S. labor costs are uh, the lowest they've been in terms of, you know, inflation in the labor market. You've got the least instance of unions presently uh, in the United States that's since the 1930s. You know, oil's down 14% this month, Carrie. Um, some of those things, housing affordability is, is the best it's ever been. I'm not saying housing Things bottomed, but I'm saying sure. it hasn't been this cheap in a hell of a long time, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that there are those things, um, and then you get this whole fiscal cliff pressure coming in the new year, where the way that the you know inept politicians have structured it may in fact be the start of something really productive in the sense of they've got this you know if we can't agree this this automatic thing kicks in and it's none of our fault, you know that yeah. system of fiscal fiscal restraint kicks in of necessity because they couldn't come to any agreement. And I think that's probably the most productive thing we've seen in a while in a year where we've had fiscal, you know, uh, a deficit year after year after year and no attempt at all to cut spending. And you're starting to see that we may be coming into a new paradigm on that front as well. Yeah, well, we still have to see all these bad assets that are out there, all that debt get liquidated and we haven't seen it yet. And they're scared to death because that will, if all that debt got wiped off, that has no value to it or very little, if it's worth five, 10 cents on the dollar, that would be a lot, especially a lot of the mortgage and agency debt. If it all got written down, we would have a massive deflationary collapse across the world. So they haven't come up with a means of dealing with the debt, both private and public. And that is a major failing of the political systems, both so-called free and not so free, because they've all got the debt. It's hiding all sorts of places. It's blowing up around us. And who's going to deal with the debt? That's what I want to know. Forget about creating new debt, all right, which is the deficit in the U.S., but yeah. how do we deal with all that debt that's been built up over generations and can't be paid back. I want to know that. And no one out there, if they have a clue, they're not sharing it with us, are they? Well, it, because it's actually a very simple thing. It won't be repaid. That's, that's just it. You know, the average OECD, the average debt of the OECD countries today, total debt, you know, whether it's government and household business, all of it, is averaging 450% debt to GDP. So you just have never had such a, uh, a level. And it's, it's, it's ridiculous. It's not sustainable, all those things. Hence, it won't be, in my view. So what you're seeing is that it's going to go back to which countries have some discipline in their people and in their spending. So what you see, for example, it's interesting that the 10-year uh, bond yields, um, the, the, the uh, German bonds, were issued this week with a 1.35 yield, and two-year bonds were issued with zero, less than zero, actually, as a return. At the same time, you have, you know, um, the Greek bonds all, you know, being issued at... In, 
insanely high rates, which clearly won't, won't be sustainable or paid. But what does that really reflect? It's nonsense to assume that those bonds are going to be paid back at that rate of interest, clearly. There's no money to do that. And it's crazy to think that the Deutschmark uh, denominated, or sorry, excuse me, Deutschmark, the German denominated bonds should be paying less than zero. But I think it's really just cutting to the nub of the matter, which is about currencies. In other words, how will the Eurozone break up? I think it's quite clear that you will either have Germany exit and go back to a, a much stronger currency in something like a Deutschmark. Um, and that, that very fact is why bondholders are buying these issues presently with zero yield, because they're looking to the very strong likelihood of a currency appreciation for Germany. At the same time, you know, why are they not prepared to buy uh, Greek bonds at, at basically any price here? Well, because it's very likely they're going to a drachma again or leaving, exiting somehow the current currency situation, which means that really, I, I, my point is, I think that thinking people in the world are already looking through all this. I don't think it's the end of the world. I don't think it's a catastrophe for civilization. I think it's going to be a lot of work. It's going to have to change certain behaviors and paradigms and systems that have, you know, been run into the run to the max over the last few years. We have to change some of those things. But this, as I said, is zeros. We need to write off the zeros. And if we do that, and we will, I'm sure we will, we'll do some of it in a very abrupt way where there's collapse and sudden, you know, disorderly defaults. And we'll do a bunch of other stuff in the normal legal process that we've dis established, Carrie, and used for hundreds of years in capitalism. You know, the resolution process doesn't mean b that uh, bank deposit holders have to lose everything. It doesn't mean that. If we do it in the correct legal process, it means that equity shareholders get wiped out. Sorry, guys, that's the risk you took. That uh, creditors to the, to the institutions probably don't get paid. That's part of doing business. You know, senior debt guys get written down, maybe get pennies on the dollar. And the other bondholders maybe get an exchange for equity. And we go on. It's not the end of civilization. Yeah, well, the problem is, though, that uh, yeah, if there's something abrupt, okay, an abrupt write-down where everybody at the same time comes to this realization that uh, we're not getting paid – and they all head for the exit door at the same time, which is certainly a possibility, if not a probability. And a bunch of these banks start going down. What happens then? So you wipe out the shareholders, you probably wipe out the creditors, and you liquidate, you pay back a certain amount on the dollar of um, – of the depositors, you protect them. No, the depositors, extent. they get back all of their money because their mm -hmm. funds were trust in trust in the institutions. They were customers. They were not clients or investors in the bank. They were customers. Mm -hmm. So the, the rule of law dictates that those funds do not go into the coffers of the, the institutions that are going bankrupt. Yeah, but the problem is MF Global, United States, this situation of total lawlessness in the financial sector and yeah. we have yet to see that right itself and and also the fact is that uh, if there's tens of trillions of dollars worth of deposits all right and everybody else gets wiped out and you're talking wiping out loans of necessity it's got to lead to a major deflation so will they ever allow this to happen or will they just go for broke with the printing press and uh well, they could go for they could go for broke with the printing press, but I would submit to you that gravity will have its way in the end. And it will not work that they will be continuing to inflate and 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 avoid this in the long run. Um, look at what they've done in the last three years, Carrie. These are Herculean uh, efforts that have been taken by governments and central banks. And you know the problem is that the carrying costs are now enormous. They're a tourniquet around the neck of the economy. There's much less capital available for everything else because they're trying to service debt, and that's at these incredibly low levels. Even at these levels, they don't have enough funding for everything that's needed. And so they, that's where, you know, I go back to, they can pretend a little while longer. You might see some more talk out of the Fed, but we're at the end of this rope, and they cannot just 
you know, keep something that is impossible moving forward indefinitely. And I think that we're very close to the point where you're going to see a major disruption. And I think it may indeed come from the Eurozone uh, area. Uh, It may indeed come from disappointment at stimulus efforts out of China. You know, that whole point I just mentioned. What if they disappoint everyone and don't throw a bunch of good money after bad? You know, which I think they have a much more higher test because fewer people control the actual capital. Uh, So I just, you know, I don't think it's a good time. And let me go back to the MF Global thing. Little understood about that is that there was actually legal uh, loopholes, you may call it, but in the actual documentation of those accounts, which if the client had a um, margin account with the firm, they were subject to rehypothecation, which was in the client agreement, okay, should never have been allowed rehypothecation, but it was, it was legally in the contracts with the clients that if you were, you know, using their margin and had some indebtedness to the firm, that your assets could then be flipped over as collateral for trading for the firm. So it is not true to say that people who are generally speaking on deposit at banks are under the same risk as um, a margin account with a commodities broker like MF Global. So I I suggest that it's it's possible to contain or be extremely diligent in protecting your capital, and it doesn't require you to necessarily take everything out and put it under your house. Yeah, well, we're going to see, I I have a feeling we're going to find out sooner rather than later if MF Global uh, won't be cubed and cubed again, because... It just seems that, uh, you know, even though they had the right to rehypothecate, they didn't have the right to use uh, client funds to cover their own bets. And that's also what happened there. There's no question about it. The money got misappropriated, and uh, that's been well established. But all this kind of ties in with what's going to happen with the public pension funds because those promises can't be honored because the rates of return assumed for those funds too high, totally unrealistic, especially in a, uh, in an era of declining uh, returns and, and declining wealth. So the public employee unions, as well as many of the private ones, they're, they're all part of this problem too. And they're a stakeholder and they seem to be as unreasonable as uh, as anybody else involved in the process. So it's a lot of different interests that are going to have to be dealt with at some point. And, you know, as we call it in the U.S., when the Congress sits down to come up with a solution, they uh, they basically make sausage. And that's kind of what we're looking at here, right? Well, yes. But, um, you know, I think part of the reason we – with the ease of credit that we've had in the last 20 years and longer, what we created was an infantile mentality among a a broad swath of the population. And I mean that in the kindest possible way. People were not held accountable. People did not have to have money to buy things. People did not have to pay their bills to get more credit. They could have bad credit. Nothing mattered. It was a free-for-all, right? So what you got was a a generation of people who were um, naive, misinformed, unreasonable in their expectations, uh, assuming entitlements that would magically appear. And I think now we're into the phase where people realize that, you know, it's nonsense. They can't keep getting that free money and there is no free lunch. So, you know, the the public pension data, uh, Carrie, I've been talking to pensions for, you know, 10 years saying, you, you have to adjust your expectations for return because you're in a secular bear market. You cannot be passively allocated with huge chunks of capital and expect that to make your 8% target. It's not going to work, right? Mm-hmm. So it, they, they kept saying, well, thank you very much, Ms. Park, but this guy over here assures us we can. And they'd go up the street to the manager who could you know, make them the promise what they were looking for. Well, there's two people or more than two sides complicit in that. One is the pension fund who doesn't want to hear the truth truth because they turn to the company who doesn't want to put in the extra funding and they turn to the employees who don't want to increase their contributions. So everybody takes the you know blind pill together and they all go back to sleep. But they keep 
having to wake up now each year with this billowing hole. And the longer this goes on, the more foolish they look. But they still have, the rubber has to hit the road in the sense of they actually have to face the math at some point. And that's what that article, you know, um, that I posted on the blog where Mayor Bloomberg, you know, basically said, it's farcical. You're assuming a ridiculous rate of return, whether it's eight, whether it's seven, indeed, whether it's six, given that current interest rates are where they are. It's impossible to assume on any rational argument that you're going to be able to catch up these huge deficits. So the, the truth is the pension plans have to be completely restructured. It's not good enough because as soon as they lower the expected return by a couple of percent. Now their huge holes, which are re- already mammoths, will become twice as big. And then the, then the accounting laws kick in and say to the companies, okay, now you're going to have to catch up that hole over the next five or 10 years. And this is the amount you're going to have to take out of income every year to put into the pension plan. And boy, that's not popular because you've got a whole investor class, carry, an executive class running these companies of people who also wanted a free lunch. They want no risk, they want outsized gains every year, and they want great dividend stream. So because everybody is unreasonable and expecting ridiculous things, I say now is the time for adult-like conversations, for people to take responsibility and understand the math can't work out the way it is, and just get back to work. Yeah, well, I hope you're right, Danielle, because everybody has to come to the same conclusion at the same time that what they've been sold was a bill of goods, their cushy retirement compliments of the taxpayer or the expected returns from wall street, wherever wall street might be in the world, isn't going to happen. And that if they don't start producing, they're going to perish. And I don't know, that's a bitter pill for the, population of the Western world world to swallow. They wouldn't swallow it in Greece. They sure don't want to swallow it in France, but I do agree with you that pretty soon they are not going to have a choice because the reality is going to hit them squarely in the eyes and everything is going to fail. And on that cheerful note, Danielle, (laughs) (laughs) jugglingdynamite.com. And uh, you can hear this interview and many others that Danielle and I have had over the months on financial survival network.com. And we'll talk to you in a couple of weeks, Danielle. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you, Carrie. Bye. Be well.